Can, is the audio working okay? We're good? Okay, mm -hmm. fantastic. Uh, as Putty said, thanks so much for joining us for our first fireside chat. Uh, obviously, we're hoping to see everybody in person, but um, on Zoom is how we're, how we're doing it now. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Damien shortly, who is the Chief Creative Officer at WeTransfer and also the founding shareholder. He also recently published a book called The Trust Manifesto, which we'll be chatting a little bit about um, as well. So let's just jump straight into things. Um, so Damien, actually, can you give yourself a little 30 second uh, spiel to the audience who might not be familiar with you yet? You just did it for me. <laughs> is there, is uh, so, there anything that I missed? No, that's about it. Um, so I'm here locked up in Amsterdam. Um, actually, it's probably one of the better places to be. We've seen it's reasonably relaxed. Sun is shining. Um, I have to say this is one of the first um, fireside chats I've done without a fire and without being actually to be able to chat to someone in, in real life. So this is a, this is a new reality for everybody. Um, we, we said before the call that we would try to see how long we can get yeah, through I was this call mention without, that. <laughs> without the C word and I probably already failed. Um, but yeah, so I've been 10 years with WeTransfer now pretty much from the beginning. Um, we've seen, you know, fantastic growth, um, by really just supporting the creative community. And that's the part that I think is the most exciting, um, the bit that we transfer does very differently to a lot of other companies um, in really being there as a sort of enabler. And prior to that, I worked in um, various advertising agencies and um, uh, moved between London, LA and uh, Amsterdam. And we're now back in Amsterdam and we've been here about nine months. Um, my book is published in the UK and Penguin is the publisher and, and they've been very helpful in setting up conversations like, like this. So very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, so as you mentioned, um, you know, you're the founding stakeholder of a really innovative tech company, but your background I think is very different from that of, you know, the cookie cutter tech entrepreneur. So can you kind of start by walking us through how you went from working, at, I believe, was it Stella McCartney to kind of we transfer and I believe you started your own company, Present Plus. Mm -hmm. So can you walk us through that journey? Yeah, sure. Um, it's my daughter. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the whole, the whole, my whole trajectory is basically a combination of happy accidents. So um, I was living in Cape Town. I met my, my girlfriend, my now wife um, in, in Cape Town. And she convinced me to go back and study in London. Um, the amazing thing is that I got, a, I got a, 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 an opportunity to study at London School of Economics, but what I didn't realize is having left the country and come back in again, that I would have to pay foreign tuition fees. So the only way that I could really make it work was by getting a job. And uh, I was lucky enough to, to get a job with uh, Gucci Group and then Stella McCartney. And um, it was such a small team that we were also able to do a mul you know, multitude of different things. So um, they were interested in doing fly posting at the time. And um, I thought that it was something that I could probably organize and, and, uh, and do myself. So I set up mm -hmm. a small fly posting uh, company on the side whilst, whilst working and studying. Um, and then realized that actually I wasn't doing very much studying. I was spending most of my time working. And the area that I was really quite interested in was, was advertising and media. And not because I really wanted to you know, be in advertising, but more that I liked the idea of the variety that, um, that the advertising world gives you. And that it, it so often comes down to trying to find a really clear, single-minded thought that is going to be the, the, the single thing that a company gravitates around. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward a, a number of years and we set up a studio called Present Plus in Amsterdam. We transfer was set up by a friend of mine, Nalden. And um, we decided basically that we were going to, um, you know, focus as much as we possibly could on doing we transfer, mm -hmm. but... Um, we needed to pay the bills. And the only way really that we could do it was by having consultancy work and stuff on the side. So Present Plus always helped us to, to funnel and, boot, and bootstrap uh, WeTransfer. Um, so was grace, that the same team? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, so in 2000 and, um, 2015, we merged the Present Plus team with WeTransfer. And basically okay. from that moment onwards, um, probably for the first time in my life, I just focused on doing one thing. Mm -hmm. Up until then, I'd always been doing a multitude of things and probably badly. 
So how did you, um, how did you get connected with the foundry team at WeTransfer? Uh, so the, the real story is that um, Nalden uh, was uh, with a partner called Bus Behrens. They just mm -hmm. started, um, but um, Nalden was looking for a garage um, to park what was then a really fancy car. He had this Lotus Elise, and I happened to have a garage. So I said, look, uh, you can just use the garage if you want, but then um, I want to hear more about this we transfer thing. Yeah. Um, and we sort of traded um, garage for desk space um, and later on uh, became partners. It pays to be generous. Um, so it's going to be the same. I mean, you know, the, the situation then, this is like, this is 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the peak of the recession. So, you know, there was loads of empty space, right? That was a time to, to do a deal, to actually to, to start something new because um, it was wide open. You know, mm -hmm. the, uh, the situation today is going to be very similar. It's wide open. Actually, can, so can you talk about that a little bit? Because WeTransfer was started, right, um, in the midst of the past recession. Yeah. So how did that impact? Uh, you know how you started how you grew I knew you I knew you were bootstrapped until I think 2015 was 15, it yeah late 2014 um, yeah okay yeah can you talk a little bit about uh, bootstrapping and how that impacted the business and you know what it was like starting a company where the economic landscape was it was pretty grim so I think if you're able to you know again this is I, I believe not in luck, but really in serendipity that, um, you know, the timing was sort of perfect because mm -hmm. we didn't really have any debts. We didn't really need a, a ton of money to survive. Um, at that time only had one kid. We had another one on the way. So, you know, we didn't really spend that much money on anything. So our cost of living was relatively low. If you want to start a business, you know, that's a pretty good time to do it when you can, you know, you're young enough to be able to go and get another job or do something else. So the timing was really good for me. Um, the other thing I think was that, you know, this is a time when, like I said, office space was, you know, all over the place. You could find something very cheaply, very affordably and start up something. And people mm -hmm. were very create, being very creative about lease times and lease lengths and stuff. And all of this really is pre we work in every, all the communal, uh, you know, shared working spaces. Um, being based in the Netherlands, um, uh, was a massive frustration for us. Um, in hindsight, it was one of the greatest gifts that we ever that we ever had. The Netherlands is, you know, by by, by its very nature, it's a Protestant, very Calvinistic country. So mm -hmm. frugality is really important. You know, the the idea of moving fast and breaking things is not a concept that's really appreciated or understood in the Netherlands. Interesting. Um, they would much rather take a lot longer to get to a decision, um, but you know, get to one unanimously that everybody believes in that's cost the least amount of money, but one that they can eventually act on very quickly because everyone's um, in alignment. Mm -hmm. um, then do the American model, which is basically just throw money and cash and as many people as you can at something until something sticks. And if you lose 80% of what you invested, it doesn't matter because you'll get to that 20% faster. So. Yeah. Okay. So at that time, it was a massive frustration because we could see tons of stuff happening in Silicon Valley. Things were moving yeah. at a much bigger pace. Money was being raised that was much more than anything that was happening in Europe. Um, but in hindsight, you know, the, the fact that we couldn't raise money, the fact that actually it forced us to have to, to make the business profitable by 2014, we would already mm -hmm. break even, um, meant that when it came to raising money, we could set the terms and we could set, you know, the standard for what it is that we wanted, what we expected that money to do, who those parties had leverage. Were. Yeah, we had leverage and we had control over a business model that within WeTransfer was very different from anybody else's business model. You know, we were selling ads that were full screen, that were these huge sort of takeovers that the IAB and the programmatic um, side of the ad world weren't interested in the slightest. So, you know, all of that background is the reason that WeTransfer exists today. Being a Dutch startup is the reason that it exists in its form today. Maybe it could be done somewhere else, but, you know, that's the benefit that I think we had from being in the Netherlands and bootstrapping. That's interesting. Can you, so um, the full, like the full page advertising that you're talking about, was, so that, that was the initial form of revenue and is it still the same? Um, is that still how you make the most amount of money now? 
No, it's relatively evenly split between subscriptions and, and advertising. So we, okay. um, we had until 2018, we only really did one thing, file, file transferring. That's what we were mm -hmm. known for. And we had 50% um, of our revenue coming from ads and 50% through like the premium, um, larger file type, um, password protected sort of um, pro service that we offered. And then okay. in 2018, we launched a platform called We Present, which is a massive content storytelling platform. Um, and we bought a company called 53 and they had a, or they have a drawing app called Paper and a pretty amazing presentation tool, collaborative presentation tool called Paste. Um, and in addition, we launched a, an iOS app called Collect. So now we have a bit more of a breadth to what we transfer re mm -hmm. is and represents. Um, but uh, right up until 2015, it was just really one product. So how did you, uh, in those early days, you know, as you mentioned, you're seeing like these competitors raising huge rounds and developing their products really quickly. How did you go about, um, you know, getting advertisers to pay for your product, especially uh, coming out of the recession? Um, everything about WeTransfer has come down to a single um, ambassador that has lobbied and rallied for we transfer internally um there was a there was a guy at vodafone who loved we transfer mm -hmm. and you know large corporation like vodafone has a certain amount of media budget there will always be stuff um or media that they buy that is um you know, very predetermined, very standard. And there's always a little bit that's left over for a sort of air experimentation. Um, and we were always that experimentation pot. So for years, we um, were seen by brands like Ben & Jerry's or Vodafone or um, BMW or Mercedes-Benz, whoever it was, is the sort of experimentation money. Um, over time, it changed drastically. Post Cambridge Analytica, post Donald Trump's inauguration, what we saw is that there was a growing distrust of the internet, a growing distrust yeah. of news. Um, uh, brands didn't want to be uh, sitting alongside, you know, untrustworthy news content and a platform like WeTransfer that only does one thing and there's, in, there's only one ad running on WeTransfer any one time. It's completely brand safe. You know, you can run a full page ad on our platform um, and it will never sit alongside another piece of content, literally. Um, so it's a very safe place for advertisers to, to exist. So we saw that those ambassadors, you know, slowly became um, advocates who advocates, became, yeah. uh, uh, we, and, and eventually just became standard. So for the, you know, major brands like, like uh, Squarespace and Moo and Vimeo and Apple, um, they consistently advertise with us um, as it's become, you know, one of the world's best branding platforms Mm -hmm. um, and what I think is really interesting about WeTransfer, which I'd love to, uh, for you to touch on a bit, is that especially in the early days where so much of the revenue was coming from advertising, you still devoted 30% of kind of that um, advertising space to creatives. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because we came from a creative space, I think you said at the beginning that, um, you know, we weren't necessarily normal tech startup uh, entrepreneurs. Um, we'd come from a design space. The things that you know really got us excited back in 2009 and 10 were really about UX um, as opposed to engineering. Um, the things that we were you know, designing and, uh, and, and producing for clients were really all about um, aesthetic on the internet. Mm -hmm. And Interesting. 2009, you know, the, net, the web wasn't particularly attractive. I mean, if Wikipedia and Craigslist is sort of the, the exception today, that's what the majority of the web looked like. So, you know, we, we were in a place where we were doing an awful lot of design work and, um, and UX work for, for clients. Um, and the people that immediately responded best to it were the creative community, artists, musicians, uh, designers, illustrators. Um, and because we couldn't sell all the ad space, you know, we would just give away an awful lot of it to promote friends' work or a friend's album or a friend's new exhibition. Um, and over time, you know, that, that just became something that um, everybody within the company rallied behind. You know, with the, we, in the early days, we were getting something like a 6% click-through rate on the ads that we were running. And if mm -hmm. we had 2 million people, you know, clicking on an ad at 6%, we would bring down most artists' websites. Oh, and that was the sort of goal was, you know, 
uh, if they would email us <laughs> and say that we managed to crash their site, then that was Mission success. accomplished. Yeah. yeah, we're giving them more traffic than they'd ever experienced in their life. Yeah. Um, and that basically carried on from there. You know, we, we moved to the States in um, 2016. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we noticed that, the, you know, the, the amount of support for the arts is a lot less. The amount of funding for the arts is significantly less. It's so much, uh, so much of it's done by um, private individuals and private institutions that we um, could see that we, we could just make a lot of impact, particularly in the States when we focused mm-hmm. on it. And then a, a series of events happened, like the Parkland shootings. Um, and I think it made us change the way that we really saw what we could do with the platform. And uh, a friend of ours commissioned a film using war um, veterans, uh, talking about how unnecessary it was to have you know, semi-automatic weapons in, in society. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we showcased that video online. We produced a lot of content um, with uh, victims of gun crime. Um, and, you know, this was so well received. It got taken by Emma Gonzalez to the March, uh, to the March for Our Lives in Washington wow. um, and was shown in front of 20 million people or something. Wow. And I think from that moment onwards, we, you know, it was obvious that we have a, a sort of um, uh, an obligation really to do something with the, the platform that we have. Um, you know, we at the moment are giving away um, something like 500 million impressions to support artists and, uh, and the community um, that, that use and have lived from and benefit and pay for our service. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that it's something that we'll hopefully always continue to do. It's, um, we always saw it as a magazine, right? If we transfer has these beautiful images rotating every 40 seconds, you yeah. can't just show ad after ad after ad. It needs to be some degree of editorial or beautiful content in between it. And that's the experience that we would like to make sure exists on the platform that um, people are stimulated by beauty and, and good stories. Yeah. That kind of, um, that focus on kind of your initial goal and how it went from, you know, making sure the UX is really beautiful to supporting artists to, you know, supporting the community. Um, Do you think that not taking on initial investment allowed you to do that since you didn't have, you know, VCs um, breathing down your neck, so to speak, and focusing just on the revenue, you could kind of, uh, you know, choose what you wanted to focus on? Yep, 100%. And also that we were a small team. So I think um, they're all very closely related. Um, we didn't have very much money, so you can't hire that many people. So you don't have that many chiefs in a very little wigwam. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's, very, it's very straightforward. The more people you have, the more voices you have, the more opinions, um, the more you will get distracted or pulled or the harder it is to, to, to remain focused. You know, right up until... 2015 when we had we had well over 20 million people using the platform um you know we were still only something like 20 people uh it you know oh, really? very small company given the scale that we were operating at um so those things you know i think go hand in hand what was that like though because yeah on one hand um you know like keeping it small you can keep it really focused which is great but then on the other side how do you make sure that you don't lose out on the potential benefit of getting those other voices there? Like, how do you um, kind of, how do you, how do you balance the two and make sure that you're getting different, different sides of the table without compromising your values? Um, I'm not sure I know what you mean. Like, um, you know, you were saying that you could keep the, you could keep the team small and focused. Mm-hmm. Um, but then how did you make sure that you didn't like lose out by not bringing in, um, you know, external talent, people had that had different perspectives from you. Oh, oh I don't know. Isn't that the difference between FOMO and JOMO? Yeah, the I guess joy, so. <laughs> the joy of missing out, the fear of missing out. Yeah, um, I guess that's it. <laughs> again, like I said, you know, I think at the time we were frustrated that, you know, we weren't able to get in, you know, super Silicon Valley talent and, yeah. um, you know, scale it beyond, uh, you know, or limits who wanted to be the unicorn in hindsight it is a gift so you know maybe it's uh, that i'm older i've got kids um i'm looking at the world in a very through a very different lens today mm-hmm. um, but um uh, no i have no i have no real regrets there are things that i think i would have done differently but it's it's played its path right and it's it's played out um i still feel like this is day one it's not like this is a company that's finished and done. You know, we've done an amazing job at 
building a brand that I think people really trust. Um, you know, in my book, that's something that, well, it's called the trust manifesto, right? I mean, it is all about this concept that I think was greatly neglected by an awful lot of the tech industry in this rush to amass as many users as you possibly could to um, at all cost get people onto your platform and to try to get them hooked or addicted mm -hmm. or to create users. You know, the language that we even use, I think is quite telling as to how you know, people view their customers. Um, and I think, you know, what we managed to create is pretty, it's pretty spectacular. It gives us huge permission to go into so many different directions. Mm -hmm. And that, um, again, you know, I think it's, it's partly down to our origins and that we came from the offline world where we were designing experience, you know, for, uh, for sort of retail that moved into online that, that didn't get funding, that did things in a different way than perhaps the rest of the tech industry was looking to, to do. Um, and the way I describe it today is, you know, we basically applied uh, offline values online mm -hmm. and everything we were trying to do was create a great experience for the customer, have confidence, build something that people would want to come back to you without having to force them or to lock them in or close the loop. Um, and I think that's been hugely successful for us. Um, it's something that only very few companies, I think, on, on the web have really understood and done well. And I don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of those companies that managed to use this a similar sort of skill set also came or uh, as founders were uh, from the design world. Take Airbnb. Yeah. Um, qu quickly, before we move on to kind of expansion and where you're at now, can we circle back to, um, you said you were finding kind of the first clients and they were turning into advocates and you were really using up the kind of experimental, the experimental, um, budget so to speak of different corporates i know a lot of our tech club members are either kind of in the early days working working with corporates or looking to approach them um do you have any pieces of advice on that um i think it's always good if you can try and find the person who's got that experimentation budget mm -hmm. um i was talking to somebody yesterday who uh, was building out technology that's um the intention that she has for it is it's facial recognition software that will be used for the educational sector and particularly to help um, autistic kids to understand um, how to read uh, emotion and how to read people's faces to, 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 to develop more, a greater sense of empathy. Um, however, on the route to get there, you know, the, one of the easiest ways to um, monetize her startup was to, you know, get a sponsor like WPP or Omnicom on board who would use exactly the same technology, but to understand whether people like their ads or not okay. so they would run a you know a dove commercial or a pepsi commercial and monitor and measure a thousand people's faces to to see how they're responding um and the way that she managed to finance her startup was through you know through the advertising and, and media world um i think it can be really beneficial as long as you've got a very clear path um, and very clear understanding as what it is you do and you and you don't do excuse me if you don't I think uh, it, can be, it can be quite dangerous that you get distracted and you start trying to build stuff to please an industry that's particularly fickle or you know, short, short term orientated. Um, but yeah, the experimentation budget was definitely the way that we managed to get in. The other thing I think is really important is there is, um, you know, there's a, there's a great need for everybody to, to test everything today. Um, and I, I, and I think, something that we definitely didn't do in the beginning was test. We just produced something. We designed something that we thought was great and took a risk. And in between, you know, to the, to we transfer, there was about 10 other startups that failed on the way. So it's mm -hmm. not that there was only, you know, one thing going on, but I, but I do believe that um, it is super important that you, that you develop something that you have a clear idea of what it is that you want to do and that you make sure that it's differentiated. If you do that, you'll find people that are willing to take a risk on you. I think. The basically, I mean, a very Americanism, but the, the more the more daring, the better. I'm American, so that's perfect. <laughs> um, actually, okay, question I should have asked at the start. What exactly is a chief creative officer? Well, I'm basically responsible for everything that has any sort of um, visual aspect to it that, that leaves the building. So because we're a bit of a complicated company and that we have five or six different products, 
Yeah. Um, we have an editorial platform that, you know, 4 million readers uh, spend up to four minutes, you know, um, per article on site. Um, we have an editorial team that produces everything that, that falls under my responsibility as well as the advertising side of the business, as well as the marketing that we do that that's external. Um, okay. So it's basically anything that um, that's visual or creative that comes in or out of we transfer. Um, okay. I used to have titled chief marketing officer, but it's the way that we transfer operates is a lot of the stuff that we do, even on we present, you know, is marketing at the end of the day, it's storytelling. Our intention is to inspire people through a platform like we present to get them to draw something through a, a, an app like paper to then get them to create a mood board on collect to share an idea through paste with a group of friends and eventually to export it through WeTransfer. So we're trying to cover the spectrum of like inspiration through to delivery. Um, okay. And it's pretty hard to find a title that covers it all. Yeah. But it's the best one we can find. Any, anybody has any suggestions, more than happy to change it again. No, no, no. Chief Creative Officer, that sounds nice. It, it makes sense now once you talk about, um, once you talk about that full uh, development process. Um, can you talk a little bit about the U.S. expansion and then how you went about um, raising the money before and why you decided to, I think, you, did you start in L.A. for a year? Yeah. Expansion? Okay. And then, yeah, can you talk a little bit about how and why you chose there? Have you been to L.A.? Yes. Okay. That's why. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, that answers it. <laughs> the sun. No, every, everybody was going to San Francisco. and um, No, uh, LA is much better. We didn't need to raise money, is. right? So if you don't need to raise money and you're trying to build tools for the creative community, you basically need to choose between LA and New York. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are other cities. I know it. I, maybe that's too simplistic. But in, in generally, there are two big cities, uh, LA and New York. Um, we had an advisor on our board called Troy Carter. He was based in LA. He's a huge advocate for Los Angeles. Um, and what I loved about LA is that you know, physically it's nearly all single story dwellings so that the yes. possibility to expand there is huge from a city's point of view. It's, it felt like we were getting in relatively early, even though there's 30 million people that live there. It builds up so much. Yeah. New York just felt like it's already done. You know, it's already, it's already so crammed and crowded and noisy that, um, uh, we didn't feel like we would get the sort of traction um, that we could do if we moved to Los Angeles. And uh, absolutely no doubt it was the right move. And the city embraced us, right? They loved the fact that we moved there, that we opened up offices there. We were, um, we did, you know, a number of initiatives to try and support local community. And it's a very generous place. I think LA's, um, it's, a, it's a metropolitan, right? So much like London, it's not, one big city it's london you know but then 400 years uh, in, the, in the past with these mm -hmm. metropolitans these villages that are not yet connected so from malibu to pasadena you know it's 30 miles um over time it will probably be reconnected and there'll be transportation links it's just early days still for that city um and it's much i mean in uh, what we saw between 2016 and 2019 was just the amount of money that was pouring into the city driven by Netflix and Hulu and Apple and yeah. Facebook and none of that creative development was happening in San Francisco It was all basically being commissioned and produced out of out of LA So I think to anybody that's considering moving to America to to, to start up or to expand I, I really think that places like Los Angeles or even like um, Boulder and Colorado are much more interesting. You'll get much more support much more visibility um, and much more of a community sense than you will do by moving to San Francisco and New York. How did you go about getting that uh, initial visibility and kind of like brand awareness? I mean, we're quite lucky that WeTransfer is already pretty well known. So we had a bit of a head start. Um, a lot of it was really doing what we'd done in Holland, you know, supporting artists immediately getting into the artistic uh, uh, community um, giving them wallpaper space, supporting museums, um, you know, supporting uh, exhibitions that were opening, supporting commissioning film. Um, and it doesn't, you know, this isn't millions and millions of, of dollars or euros or pounds. It's relatively small amounts of money, um, but um, majority, you know, is time. Uh, not many people expect you to, to take the time to want to help, um, to really, you know, help somebody's career launch. 
when mm-hmm. you do and when you can demonstrate you've done it before and uh, and people are given that opportunity to experience the brand through through a human which i know sounds stupid but you know we're uh, as a tech business right and as a file transfer business um it's quite surprising how many people would say oh i had no idea that we transfer actually you know existed or that you were dutch or that you uh you you know you offered this sort of thing because we're so transactional we're just hurriedly getting on with our busy days and not really not really thinking about it but when most people stop and pause they go oh yeah quite i quite like that i think it's quite cool well on that topic of kind of conscious consumption it's a good um transition to your book the trust manifesto uh so can you talk a little bit about uh like why you decided to write it I think um, something I haven't been very good at within the company is um, necessarily always writing down um, you know, the direction that we're going in or the things that we did well or you know, producing um, case studies or uh, guidelines for things. And um, what, uh, what I realized was that when, you know, when we actually put things down on paper and when we really thought them through, that they, some of the things that we were doing were quite, were quite different. And certainly what was happening was between 2009 and 2015, we were struggling to get people to take us seriously. And I mean that from the point of view of, you know, we were the challenger in the advertising world. We were the challenger in the file transfer world. You know, we weren't quite as big as Dropbox. We hadn't done the series A, series B, you know, levels of funding to yeah. get on the radar of TechCrunch and all the rest of it. So we were, um, I wouldn't say we weren't taken seriously, but we were, we were just sort of a nice to have. Bill Gates called us the plumbing of the internet. We were just sort of you know, behind the walls and essential, but not visible enough that people would you know, put you on the front of the walls and, and break open the walls to show the pipes. Um, what I noticed was though that when I moved to the States, um, it was really that around that time of Cambridge Analytica and Donald Trump's inauguration that um, so much of the conversation was happening around things that we as a company had intuitively done that mm-hmm. were all about offline values online that were, um, you know, we'd been talking about a lean data policy because we just believed in, um, you know, keeping things simple and that we didn't necessarily need to have a lot of data to run a business. We could prove that we could run an advertising business without knowing exactly, you know, what the time of the month was or what color socks you were wearing. We could still run a very successful business with a limited amount of information. Um, and a lot of these things that we've been talking about for years just seem to suddenly click into place. Um, and I thought this is the moment that we should actually, or I should document it, um, try to find out, you know, what, what people think about the web and, uh, and what we've been doing and then think about what, what needs to happen to protect it. Because um, what I was certainly witnessing with my kids was that they were spending more time online than anywhere else, particularly in the States. People are a bit paranoid about kids playing on the streets. So my kids were spending, you know, up to 20 hours a week behind the screen mm-hmm. um, playing and experiencing and talking to people that there were just no controls around. There's no neighborhood watch. There's no police. There's no, there's no sort of checks in place. And um, what I, you know, what I was concerned about was uh, a lot of companies had been set up that had very different value sets to the values that we had. And what I was trying to do, what I would like to implore people to do is to think about our responsibility as individuals. What do you and I want from the internet? What do we think is acceptable? And then as companies to think about, okay, you know, how are we going to grow our business and make sure that it's sustainable and do it in a manner that actually makes sense? And that I would sit and tell my kids that, you know, the, what, I, what I do and how I do it. And not that you want to be in a position where you're working for a tobacco company, um, but you would never want your kids to smoke because you know that what you're doing is horrendous. It should be, you know, we should be proud and openly talking about um, what we do as a company and how we operate and um, allowing our kids to experience what we do without feeling shame or embarrassment or regret. And then lastly, that um, the internet, you know, has grown at such an incredible pace but it's grown a long way away from where we initially wanted it to be, I think. And if you look back at where, you know, Tim Berners-Lee started the internet and what he wanted to create and what, you know, what was happening today is a very different place where Amazon, Facebook, Google, Apple, um, pretty much control the entire web. You know, 86 cents on the dollar goes to two companies in terms of advertising revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, 
uh, that, that I just think is unnecessary and that's been allowed to happen because there's no regulation. And there's no regulation because we haven't been lobbying hard enough for it to be regulated. Um, and we've allowed these companies to get more control than ever before um, because of convenience, because they moved very fast and they gave us tools that um, we, we just don't sim simply look at through the same lens as we do the offline world. We are all in a rush on the internet and we think, oh, I'm just yeah. going to quickly order that thing. What do I need? Um, Amazon will have it for me. I'm just going to get it from there. And what you pass over, what you hand over and what you get in return, I don't think is a fair value exchange. And that's something that I wanted people to just take a, take a second and question. Um, and that's, um, that's the book. I have so many questions. Um, firstly, being in the US and also Europe, uh, you know, there's a large discrepancy between what is uh, acceptable in terms of like data protection, like, you know, GDPR, for instance. So how do you foresee the different uh, ways that different parts of the world like view privacy? Um, how do you think that will impact like uh, the way co the way companies govern themselves or the standards that they, they hold themselves to? Okay, so now I've got to drop the C word because I think this has changed everything. So we have a new reality now, and I think this is going to change so much. Um, a few months ago, I wrote an article about um, climate change and the, the use of um, or the, the streaming wars, basically, that YouTube, um, just by streaming HD video to you to be able to watch whatever series you're watching, you know, was consuming as much electricity as the entire, uh, or it's all French households put together. Um, one of the few sites that you know doesn't that major, man, manages to offer a global service is a site like Wikipedia that's um, you know about as low-fi as you could possibly have it from a website. Yeah. Um, what I was saying was that I think that the you know the world is going to look at servers and the internet through a very different lens when they understand the carbon emissions that are being emitted from running server farms for us just to be able to watch <coughs> Ozark season three in HD. Um, and the experience that we're living through today, I think is, is the new reality that we are for once all on a level playing field, right? You're in yeah. your home. I'm in my home, Christian Purdy, everyone's sitting basically in the same, in the same, uh, reality. Um, and the tools that we have to connect with one another are the, in, is the internet and our products like zoom and, um, Skype or whatever it else is we're using. Because we're now all looking at it through the same lens, I think we're going to be so much more critical of what it is that we're doing. And we'll have, you know, people are going to have to take the time to set up their browsers properly to make sure that they're, um, you know, they're, they're, they're shopping in an ethical way or whatever else, because this is the yeah. way you're going to be doing it. So I think the exciting thing that we're going to experience through this, through this new reality is um, that I believe that people will be more critical of the internet uh, and are going to be much more critical of the tools that they're going to spend time with. I think the amount of people that are sitting at home with kids right now and are actually for the first time realizing how much time their kids spend online. Yeah. I think people are going to be going, Oh my God, have you seen screen time today? My daughter's been on TikTok for four and a half hours. This is not, this is not good. Although I'm trying not to look at my screen time <laughs> analytics right now. It's really depressing. <laughs> no, but I think this is going to be fascinating for people to, um, to be able to really analyze, you know, what's happening, how much time is, how much time is being spent, what's being consumed. I think mm -hmm. another fascinating thing that's going to happen is that we're going to, uh, you know, a couple of months from now, we're going to be really considering whether we need to have office space, whether we need to have permanent office space, you know, whether companies need to go to work five days a week, because, if we don't, if we can make businesses work in this way, you know, maybe we should just share office space. Maybe the footprint um, or the amount of carbon emissions that have been you know, reduced through us not commuting and not flying is so phenomenal that climate yeah. change activists are going to jump on this and say, come on, guys, you, you cannot go back to this is the first time in history, you know, in our generation that we've seen that we're able to make a significant impact. Um, and of course, businesses have been affected and of course, some businesses yeah. you know, need to change. But I think we're going to move potentially from a hyper globalization to a hyper localization, but with much more of a focus on these sort of communication tools. Um, and I think that will force us to be much more critical of um, our settings. You know, how much information we're giving, what data we're giving away. I hope this will be 
uh, somebody referred to it the other day as the great reset. I think that would be, uh, it'd be great. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it does feel like a reset because uh, kind of like a forced reset because we don't really have any other, any other choices other than to hit that button. Um, but I think on, on that note, I think that, um, you know, community is going to become more important than ever. Um, as we return to our, as we, as we can return to our normal lives, um, while maybe we can be more remote, I think, um, you know, situations where people can connect even around the world is, um, you know, we're all getting more comfortable with that, which is great. Um, but one last question before we open it up to the audience is, um, going back to what you were saying about you, how you were so focused, um, and still are on being like a community plus, uh, product and company. I, probably a lot of those big giant, um, corporates, which we were discussing earlier, you know, they probably like started out to, um, you know, with, with positive mindsets and positive goals that they wanted to uh, help people with, you know, for example, just be, being an online bookstore um, with Amazon, but, you know, obviously they, they lose that, um, lose that focus throughout the years. So how did you make sure that you didn't? Well, I don't think it's obvious that you lose that through the years. I don't think that Ben and Jerry's lost that through the years or Patagonia lost it through the years. I think it very much is down to an individual. And if you look at a company like Facebook, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has made it very clear that he wants to remain the controlling shareholder in that business. I cannot fathom, to be frank, why anybody needs to be a billionaire. It's not that I'm a socialist, but I think, you know, 100 million is a pretty good amount of money. 500 million, okay, you know, that would be a pretty good amount of money but a billion, who, who even needs it? And if you have that money, um, and I don't understand why you need to retain the control of a company when it is, it's, it's beyond you. It's, it's basically there to serve you know, the, the, the public and it's become a public tool, much like Wikipedia. You know, it should be something that I think um, you know, we as society have a role and a function and the ability to, to, to add to, to make it a you know, much better and more pleasing experience. And that's the same with Amazon. I think, um, you know, it took Jeff Bezos a hell of a long time um, before he relinquished some of his hard-earned money uh, um, and put it to put it to some good use. Um, I question the ethics behind the, you know, the leaders of those companies more than I do um, the companies themselves. Um, but I think, you know, with, with us, uh, the way the company was divided in the beginning was, was very fair, right? It was... Uh, it's been very fair. All employees are, are shareholders in the business. Um, you know, we've tried to set down ground rules for how, you know, how we do good. And what I think we've also seen is the more that we've done that, the more that our employees and the world around us respond, uh, you know, positively to the company. And I think it's just an obligation and, um, in, in good business. I don't necessarily believe in the idea of a charity. I think um, businesses have a role um, to play in, you know, providing for the local community, like the Cadbury's and Bournevilles of the world, um, you know, uh, in the previous century. Um, and I think that if every company basically, you know, from the outset dedicated a certain amount of their money or wealth or time towards supporting something to do with the community or uh, the industry that they're in, I, I, I think, it, you know, we would just be happier in general, be a much happier, more enjoyable place to live and work. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and before we turn it over to the audience, can you say where, uh, where people can find your book? Yeah. So um, there's a website, the trustmanifesto.com. Um, there are links out there to uh, various bookstores um, in the UK. Waterstones, I think, is uh, the, the biggest bookstore that's selling the book. Um, and then everywhere else, it's uh, Amazon, but if you, if you must. Um, what I would say is that all the proceeds, my proceeds from the book go to a charity called United for Global Mental Health. Um, so if uh, you don't buy the book for me, um, you could buy it for a charity that I think is doing a huge amount of good in just educating people around um, one of the biggest issues that I think will face our generation, um, particularly in the, uh, the current reality that we're, we're in right now. Well, thank you. And uh, for the audience, we're going to put that link in the email that was sent out afterwards too. So be sure to check it out. And uh, with that, let's turn it over to Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you.
right. I think Christian, do you hop on and 